uh, just the spokesperson for a phenomenal number of people who uh, all work together to make Vintage Wings a success. Uh, tonight I'm going to tell you a little bit about the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And um, the person that uh, made this PowerPoint possible is uh, one of our stalwart volunteers. It's uh, Robert Kosteka. He uh, undoubtedly has uh, thousands and thousands of hours of research in there. And there's uh, Rob smiling from the front seat of our, uh, our Harvard. The British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, or the BCATP, is uh, the largest single training plan in uh, aviation history. And uh, it's very, very important, especially to us in Canada, um, that we remember those that uh, sacrificed, that uh, gave themselves so that um, we could live in this uh, free country. One of them is uh, Wing Commander James Stocky Edwards. Uh, Stocky's still alive. He's with us. And uh, he's Canada's highest scoring uh, surviving ace. Um, very interesting story that will be with us on and off uh, for the next little while, and that's uh, Pilot Officer John Gillespie McGee, Jr. And um, unfortunately, um, McGee lost his life, look at that, at the tender age of 19. He was uh, serving in the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, and there's a picture of uh, young McGee sitting in his uh, Spitfire. He was one of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan graduates. Now, what McGee is really famous for is his poem. His poem high flight. And uh, uh, I have a copy of it in my logbook. I know when I graduated with my wings, the Canadian Forces, uh, this poem was recited. Um, it's been recited over and over again because it really captures the essence and the spirit of everything we do. Um, it's gone to the moon several times with Apollo astronauts. It's gone on board the uh, uh, space station and it's uh, been in space many, many times. I don't think there's a uh, squadron that doesn't have the poem High Flight somewhere. I know it's uh, five or six places here at uh, Vintage Wings. And I, and I can't think of anything else that captures the, um, that really captures the ecstasy of flight. And it also provides comfort for us. There's the Reagans at one of the uh, space shuttle disaster ceremonies. Uh, this poem gives us comfort. And yet it inspires McGee, there he is getting his wings. And um, Vintage Wings is based uh, just across the river from the Ottawa International Airport. And that's where uh, McGee got his wings. Let me take you um, back a little bit now. And um, we'll just talk a little bit about why the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan well, first of all, uh, there's a war on, and England's not a really good place to do pilot training. Not only is the airspace saturated, but of course, um, especially in the southern part of England, the people in the training aircraft are vulnerable to uh, enemy aircraft flying over and shooting them down. Canada offered a lot of advantages. Um, it was a safe distance from the enemies, uh, both from shooting down and from bombing. We had wide open airspace. Very, very important, though, we had aviation industry that could produce the aircraft, and we had fuel. Canada seemed like the ideal choice until you put things into perspective and remember that wherever you are in the United States, uh, with one exception, you look north, you're going to find Canada. And so while we had all these tremendous wide open spaces. We also had a climate that was uh, challenging to deal with. There's a picture of a bunch of tiger moths on skis in pilot training. I don't think they uh, had many tiger moths on skis down in Penhold. Back to the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. On our Prime Minister Mackenzie King's birthday, December 17th, 1939, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan was signed into existence. The original members of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan that split the cost of this uh, phenomenal undertaking was the United Kingdom, was Britain, Canada, New Zealand, and Australia. Franklin Roosevelt referred to the United States as the arsenal of democracy. And this is where the title from our tonight's presentation comes from is, he told Mackenzie King, our Prime Minister, that Canada was the aerodrome of democracy. 
But training pilots in Canada was nothing new. In uh, 1917, for a lot of the same reasons that they trained in 1939 and forward during the Second World War, during the First World War, Canada became a training area for the Royal Flying Corps. Um, one of the first stations that was established was uh, Camp Borden, and that's just north of Toronto in Ontario. And there's a picture of the flight line uh, in Camp Borden and the hangars. Now, um, you have to remember that uh, in these days there were no runways. Uh, the term airfield is very, very appropriate. So these aircraft uh, did not have to have any crosswind capabilities because they always took off into the wind. So if you um, capture that image of Camp Borden, 1917 in your mind, and you just go forward to uh, this summer, and there's one of the uh, World War I hangars still surviving, and uh, that's the museum at uh, Base Borden. And Base Borden is one of the places we'll be stopping into with our tour that I'll tell you a little bit about later. Canada continues to uh, train uh, many foreigners. In fact, when I went through my pilot training, we had uh, Dutch fellows that were training with us, um, but all NATO countries um, train in Canada. Now back to the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. In the Second World War, nearly half of the pilots, navigators, bomb aimers, gunners, wireless operators, flight engineers, from the British Commonwealth, nearly half trained in Canada. It's, it's a huge number. So let's just think of this for a moment. In 1939, December 17th, when the British Commonwealth Training Plan was signed into existence, Canada had 235 pilots. Four and a half years later, the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan had produced 50,000 pilots. Just to do that again, 235 pilots in 1939, 50,000 pilots were produced through the system. It doesn't end there. 30,000 observers, the name was later changed to navigators, 15,000 air bombers, 34,000 gunners, 1,900 flight engineers, 100 130,000 airmen were trained in Canada in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And just keep thinking of that number of where we started. We had 235 pilots when it started. We had no aircraft. We had no ops manuals. We had no training manuals. We had no bases. We had no infrastructure. It doesn't end there. We trained 80,000 ground personnel. And uh, another example of uh, some place where it's looking very cool. And 17,000 of these 80,000 were women. In this year of um, commemoration of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, we have to remember those that go before us. There's a few particular people, men like uh, Nelson B.C.'s uh, Robert Hampton Gray. Robert Hampton Gray uh, graduated from number 31 uh, Service Flying Training School in Kingston, or as the Fleet Air Arm called it, Collins Bay. He was awarded the posth posthumously the uh, Victoria Cross, which is our highest medal for uh, valor. And he was awarded that for an attack on a Japanese destroyer in the very waning days of the Second World War. And he, his aircraft, uh, he flew down a valley. His aircraft was taking numerous rounds. In fact, um, before he got close to the destroyer, some. Uh, witnesses claim one of the uh, bombs on his aircraft was shot off. We know most of his propeller was shot off, and he pressed on the attack, dropped his bomb, sunk the destroyer. Unfortunately, his aircraft um, was, um, uh, he was fatally wounded, and the aircraft uh, descended into the ocean and disintegrated. They never recovered anything. Interesting thing is the, uh, the Japanese thought so much of uh, Robert Hampton Gray that there is a uh, memorial on Japanese soil to honor Robert Hampton Gray, a Canadian. And um, we, we find this absolutely uh, uh, um, wonderful that somebody's taken the time to uh, honor one of our uh, Canadians. But there's more. A man from Winnipeg, Andrew Minarski, um, the Warplane Heritage has a Lancaster bomber, and it's dedicated uh, to 419 Squadron and to uh, Minarski. And he was awarded the Victoria Cross. So here we see uh, Minarski's crew. Minarski is the, in the middle, and uh, Pat is uh, out on the uh, left-hand side. Um, their aircraft was hit, and the aircraft was on fire. And so Minarski uh, walks back to save, or crawls back to save his buddy, who's jammed in the, uh, in 
the gun turret, he can't get him out. With his parachute on fire, he salutes his buddy, bails out of the aircraft, but his parachute is so badly burned that uh, he succumbs to his wounds shortly after uh, he lands and, and dies. Now, the miracle of all this is that uh, the gentleman that was stuck in the gun turret survives the crash, as does a couple of other crew members, to tell the story of our friend Monarski. There's women in the British Common Welfare Training Plan story too, Marion Orr. Here we see Marion sitting in the back seat instructing on a uh, fleet Cornell, and she was a, an instructor at one of our larger stations, and that was in Trenton. She was also a tower controller. She did more. She also ferried Spitfires uh, for the Air Transport Auxiliary. Men like um, Montreal's David McIntosh, he was a navigator. He graduated uh, from the number one Air Observer School in Malton, which is now our biggest airport in Canada, that's Toronto. He also was awarded uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross. Now, you got to remember what the job of most of these mosquitoes uh, were. They took off two-man crew at night, behind enemy lines, no night vision goggles, attacking targets of opportunity as sole operators. They also were pathfinders. This is not an enviable job, nor one that had a, a long life expectancy. Charlie Fox. Charlie Fox, uh, DFC, he instructed on Harvard's at uh, number six service flying training school in Dunville and then flew Spitfires with 412 Squadron. Now that's the same squadron that our uh, friend McGee was on. And um, Charlie Fox is famous in Canada because uh, he's credited uh, by many accounts um, with the man who strafed uh, Rommel. There's Stocky Edwards uh, two years ago at our air show. Um, one of our uh, volunteers, Dave Hatfield, uh, shepherded a P-40 restoration through many, many years. And uh, then Dave, Edward, or Dave Hatfield took uh, Stocky Edwards' uh, flying. In fact, uh, they were only supposed to go for a short while, and Stocky, at uh, close to 90 years old, didn't want to come home until the airplane was uh, almost out of fuel. I think they really enjoyed themselves. Back to the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. Instructors, the ones that stayed behind. The unsung heroes. There's Mo Fraser, um, a gentleman that's uh, absolutely pivotal at Vintage Wings. Dave O'Malley. He's responsible for all the graphics and websites. Uh, this is his father-in-law, uh, Fred Jones, an instructor in the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And another man that a lot of Canadians will resonate with was uh, Max Ward. And uh, Max Ward obviously went on to start an airline. And uh, there's a picture of uh, one of Max's 747s. So with the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, the problem we have is we focus often on the pilots. And those are the stories that capture our hearts. Those are the stories that are told. But there were many, many, many more. There's, there's the navigators, the bomb aimers, the wireless, the gunners, the flight engineers. Of course, the people on the ground that make it all work. There's the fitters and riggers. Uh, those are the engine people and the airframe people, the tower controllers, all the people that worked on the ground. And it's not, it's not without the people that actually built the airplanes. The lady on the left-hand side, um, she's painting uh, landing gear on a mosquito in the same factory that now produces the famous de Havilland uh, Dash 8. Uh, now it's building Q400s. The uh, Lancaster bomber on the right side, the Ruhr Express, that's the first Lancaster bomber uh, assembled in Canada and taken overseas. Uh, there was many more that, uh, that followed. And of course, there's the people that uh, were waiting behind. Now, in uh, telling the story of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, we had to select somebody. Um, we uh, decided that um, we would honor the people who didn't come back with selecting somebody who was still with us and uh, it was a tough, tough, tough choice. The person we selected was Bill McRae. Unfortunately, Bill McRae uh, um, passed away just uh, weeks ago, but we had all had the opportunity to spend some time. Bill shared his stories openly with us. So to select somebody, we're going to follow Bill on his path. So Bill joins the uh, Royal Canadian Air Force. Now, just while we're looking at this picture, it looks like that gentleman's got an oxygen mask on, and that's not really correct. Um, what they used to communicate between the front and the back seat 
were something called the Gosport tubes, and it was just a simple hose arrangement. So the microphone apparatus on one person went to the earphones on the other, and vice versa. And this is how they uh, communicated. So our friend Bill McRae, the first thing that Bill does is he runs off and he joins the Air Force at something called a Manning Depot. Now a Manning Depot is the equivalent to basic training and this is where you take a civilian person and you turn them into a lean, mean military fighting machine. Now our friend um, Bill, um, he joins the Armed Forces at number two Manning Depot in Brandon, Manitoba. People who live in the Toronto area will recognize the uh, CNE, the uh, Central Ex Exhibition, the Horse Palace. That was number one Manning Depot. Now, basic training lasted from two to four weeks. The uh, circle is our friend Bill McRae marching. Just think of that. They must have been extremely desperate for air crew to run through basic training in two weeks. I believe basic training these days runs um, 14 to 16 weeks. When Bill is um, finished at the Manning Depot, now he's off to do a little bit of academic training and he's going to go on to what's called initial training school. Now, at initial training school, there's quite a selection of opportunities and our friend Bill, he goes out to Regina, Saskatchewan at number two initial training school. At the initial training school, all the pilots and the navigators uh, run through the academic program and uh, they enter as uh, aircraftsmen and they, they leave as leading aircraftsmen or uh, uh, LACs. Now what happens here at this school is um, academics have a strange way of uh, steering people. If you're um, uh, quite heavily aligned into maths and sciences, it's quite possible you would have been selected to be a navigator even though your dream was to be a pilot. Um, or if you had other aptitudes, um, they would make you a pilot or it would be just random according to some of the stories I've written. Now if we come back to our friend Bill McRae, we can see young Bill smiling in the middle. And over uh, to Bill's left, our right, is uh, Albert Uhl. Now we had the honor of putting uh, Albert in our Mark 16 Spitfire um, a few years ago before he passed away. And if you look at the two pictures on the right hand side, he's just looking like a mean dude when he's a young man. He's looking like a mean dude when he's an old man and you just know you do not want to go air fighting with him. The initial training schools are everywhere and some of them exist today. If anybody in the Canadian military has ever been to staff school, that's it. And that was the um, Eglinton Hunt and Golf Course. It was seconded by the military and they just forgot to give it back after the war. Finally, 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 after initial training school, you're going to get close to an aircraft. You're going to go to uh, elementary flying training school. This is basic flying training and also the um, the uh, weeding out of pilots would happen at elementary flying training schools. The four aircraft that were used were the uh, DH-82C Tiger Moth. Now that's a North American or Canadian version of the Tiger Moth. It's got a few refinements um, that are lacking in the English Tiger Moth. Uh, we don't have leading edge slats on the upper wings. Our landing gear is a little bit further forward. Um, we've got a tailwheel in our Tiger Moth, uh, but most important, we've got a canopy. The Fleet Finch um, was a very popular training aircraft. Now, not as many Fleet Finches were built uh, as Tiger Moths, mainly because the uh, the British were responsible for supplying all the engines for the Tiger Moths. So in Canada, all we had to do was build the airframes, whereas with the Fleet Finch, we had to pay for the airframes and the engines. Being frugal Canadians, we had more Tiger Moths. The uh, Fleet Finch and the Tiger Moth were slowly replaced by the uh, Fleet Cornell. That's a low-wing monoplane. And um, for a while, the Stearman was used, uh, mainly in Alberta in the BC ATP, but the Stearman um, was not well suited, at least the ones that were sent to Canada in the cold climate, so uh, we didn't see them 
very often. So our friend Bill, he's going to go off to school. Look at all the elementary flying training schools, 36 of them. And our friend Bill goes to Portage La Prairie. And there he's flying the Tiger Moth. If you spend a moment looking at that picture, you just know it's cold. Our friend Bill is the short guy on the left-hand side as you look at this picture. You can see he's got his Gosport tube around his neck. Bill's instructor was the big, enormous fellow dressed in the darker clothes. Now, in the Tiger Moth, the instructor sits in the front seat, and little Bill was sitting in the back seat. So Bill was having an awful time landing, and they were about uh, to consider washing Bill out of pilot training. Um, till finally somebody realized that poor Bill couldn't see a thing. Once they uh, swapped uh, instructors out so that the gentleman in the front seat, the instructor was a little smaller, turned out Bill could land just fine when he had some field of view. Okay, our friend Bill graduates from elementary flying training school and he's going to go on to the next step, which is the service flying training school. Now we start to see some sobering thoughts. Uh, McCrae and his graduates, uh, only two of this group of young men survived the war. Omer Levesque on the left and Bill sit on the right survived. And ironically, they both lived close to each other in the Ottawa area for years and years. The Service Flying Training School, this is where you, if you pass, you get your wings. This is a long course. This is about 28 weeks long. And this is where we uh, see the Harvard coming into play. But it wasn't just the Harvard. Although the Harvard was the uh, aircraft of choice for all the people flying uh, single seat aircraft, um, we had the North American Yale. Um, we also had Cessna Cranes, Ox, uh, Airspeed Oxfords, and the Avro Ants. And the, uh, of course, the multi-engine aircraft for people destined for bombers, and the uh, single engine aircraft for people that were uh, off to fly fighters. So. Our friend Bill probably spent a great deal of time in these things, the link trainer. Now, every airline pilot in the world, every corporate pilot, and almost now in this day and age, every pilot in the world spends time in a flight simulator. The flight simulator program was so successful that later on in the war, they used the link trainers at the elementary uh, flying training schools, but when Bill went through, they were just at service flying training schools. The story is very, very uh, interesting. It turns out uh, Ed Link, the gentleman that designed the Link trainer, um, paddled across the St. Lawrence River to Gananoque, Ontario, and started a factory there, and all of the Link trainers, some 5,000 Link trainers, uh, were built in Gananoque, Ontario. Service flying training schools, there was 41 of those stretched out across Canada. And our friend Bill, he's going to go to Camp Borden. This is history repeating itself. Remember, Camp Borden was the place that we trained pilots for the First World War. There's Bill in the middle of the 51 initial members of his course at Service Flying Training School. This is course number 18. Out of this course, two died in training. 39 completed the course and earned their pilot's wings. Um, the rest uh, that didn't make the cut would have been uh, reclassified to some other trade. The really sobering thought is of the 39 that earned their wings, 19 didn't survive the war. At Borden, Bill would have flown the uh, North American Yale and the Harvard. And it's at service flying training school that the coveted wings, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the RCAF wings, are awarded. There's our friend Bill. My goodness, uh, when you look at him, and he's typical of the young men that were uh, being pump through the BC ATP program, you wonder if he's even shaved yet. He's 21 years old right there. Remember, McGee was 19 when he was killed. It, it, it's, it's amazing the age of the young men that were going through this program. 
But Bill's not uh, even in the theater of combat yet. Um, Bill's got to get himself across the Atlantic Ocean. And um, what would happen is uh, Bedford Basin and Halifax convoys would line up. But there was a problem in the North Atlantic. And of course, 1941, when Bill's going across, um, this is when the Battle of Atlantic is heavily swayed on the German side, and we've got U-boats out there. So of the 31 ships in Bill's convoy, nine were sunk. He's not even in the theater of, of combat for flying yet. This is the... Um, the uh, formation sailing chart, and so this is exactly how the ships are lined up. So if you look at the top uh, right corner of the matrix, we've got the Norman monarch, and that would actually be in the top right or the forward right-hand flank of the uh, convoy. In the middle, it says 5-1, five five uh, uh, Hindustan. That would have been in the middle of the convoy. So our friend Bill, uh, he's over on the right-hand side in the Nicoya. So here's this young man, hardly shaved, just fresh wings on his uniform, sailing out across the ocean, out on the right-hand flank in the Nicoya, watching all these ships being sunk. It's not over yet. There's another problem in May 1941. The Bismarck, the most powerful battleship in the world by far, is trying to sneak out into the Atlantic Ocean. The Bismarck has made a run through uh, the top of Jutland in uh, Denmark, and now it's uh, trying to sneak out between the ice off of Greenland and Iceland. It's um, traveling along, um, being shepherded, or pardon me, being shadowed uh, by the Suffolk and by a few other um, aircraft carrier, um, Catalina. Um, Catalina aircraft. And of course, um, it's already sunk the hood. This is not a good thing. And steaming out of the uh, uh, out of the Mediterranean is the Ark Royal. And on board the Ark Royal is the Swordfish. And it was a Swordfish aircraft that dropped the torpedo that damaged the rudder of the Bismarck off the Ark Royal that uh, allowed the uh, Bismarck to be sunk by Allied ships. And the, one of the gentlemen that was in that attack is Commander uh, Terry Goddard, lives just north of Toronto. We'll be dedicating to our swordfish to Commander Goddard uh, sometime this year. Um, we're just a little over four years uh, with our engine overhauls, but it'll be coming to us soon. And we'll have our swordfish in Oshkosh this year to celebrate the 100 years of U.S. naval aviation. Okay, back to Bill. There's Bill standing beside a Mark V Spitfire. Look at the smile on his face, looking pretty pretty calm for just having watched nine ships out of 31 sink on his trip to the UK. Bill sitting in the cockpit, doing some work on one of Bill's Mark IX Spitfires. Bill gets a kill. Uh, Juno Beach, June 6, 1944, and there's his citation for uh, ME-109 that, uh, that Bill's destroyed. In November, at our annual Victory Gala dinner in our hangar at Vintage Wings, we honored Bill McRae. That's a picture of him standing beside our Mark 16 Spitfire. I sat beside Bill the whole evening. It, it was my honor to relive some of these stories to talk with Bill. He was quite open. He was enthusiastic. He had a glass of wine. Dave O'Malley um, is the only one that ever made Bill cry. And Dave O'Malley, our famous uh, master of everything to do with graphics, uh, made a big banner for Bill. And at the appropriate time in the evening, the lights went down, the spotlight went on this banner, and it was uh, hosted up. And that's the only time I've seen Bill speechless. Unfortunately, we lost Bill uh, just a few weeks ago. The BCATP was um, very, very international in scope. So we trained uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, Royal Air Force people. That would make sense. But of course, Free Poles, uh, Norwegians, we would have changed Belgians, Czechs, uh, the Free French. Dutch, um, as went through the Dutch were in my training course uh, when I went through pilot training, we also trained an enormous amount of Americans. 
Notice the arm badge of the young man getting his wings pinned on, says USA. So if we look back in time a little bit, we remember that prior to Pearl Harbor, the Americans were trying very, very hard to stay neutral. And uh, it, it was, it was a, uh, a violation of the United States Neutrality Act to try and recruit American citizens on American soil to fight in a foreign war. Well, when there's a will, there's a way. Um, the same way that um, aircraft were built in the United States, landed on uh, lakes and rivers and uh, prairies and pushed or pulled across the international border and then flown away, recruiting pilots was the same way. It was the Clayton Knight Committee. And they rented a suite in the Waldorf Astoria Hotel in downtown uh, New York City and uh, opened offices eventually all across uh, the United States. Now what their angle was is they recruited for a fictitious airline. And so they um, did the initial screening of potential pilot candidates. And the candidates were sent up to Canada. And when they got to Canada, in a room would be two desks. Um, at one desk would be the fictitious airline. And wouldn't you know it, when the candidate got there, um, the airline didn't need any pilots. They, uh, they were full. But the desk right next door was the Royal Canadian Air Force recruiting desk. And uh, gee, while the pilot was there and he'd come this far, how about signing up? So sign up they did. By the time uh, Pearl Harbor happened in December of uh, 1941, 9,000 American citizens had joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. Who were these people? Oh, there were uh, many, many uh, famous and, and not so uh, famous people. Uh, how about Don Gentile? Uh, 19 uh, aerial victories and three damaged. Look what he's wearing. RCAF wings. How about his wingman? Godfrey, 18 victories. Look what these gentlemen have on their tunics. Royal Canadian Air Force wings, all graduates of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. There's more. Donald Blakesley. Look what's on his tunic. Not only did he wear Canadian wings, but he served with 401 Squadron, RCAF. And there's Blakesley shaking hands with our Prime Minister, Mackenzie King. And um, famous Americans and Canadians partook in all sorts of action, but the Dam Busters, um, we had our contribution to the jam, Dam Busters. I, I think uh, Charles, we called him Joe, I guess, so Charles McCarthy, uh, uh, look at the size of that man. Man, you'd have to redo your weight and balance. That must have been uh, our friend Bill's instructor, maybe. Captains to the Clouds, very, very famous movie. Probably one of the largest productions Warner Brothers had undertaken to date. The, um, the urban legends say that when they came to Canada to make this movie, the uh, parade of vehicles bringing equipment and people up to make the movie ranged out two and three miles. And this movie was made as a political and a PR event to try and tell Canadians that all this money they're spending on uh, training pilots is worthwhile. This movie was shot in many, many locations, including uh, Ottawa, where we're at. The movie was shot at number two service flying training school in Uplands, and that's where our friend McGee got his wings. He was uh, at the Central Flying School in Trenton in uh, Mountain View, just near Trenton, and of course uh, these people had to be recruited, and they were recruited at that horse palace in uh, downtown Toronto, which was the Manning Depot. Oh, and there's our hero uh, trying to debrief uh, some poor young guy that's having trouble with uh, aerial shooting. Now this is an actual cameo of a wings parade. Um, they wanted to make this movie, but they they did not want to impede the production of pilots in any way, shape, or form. So this is an actual Wings graduation parade that they're filming while they're making the movie. And the hero who's pinning the wings on is a cameo appearance by uh, Air Vice Marshal Billy Bishop. Um, Billy Bishop was our highest scoring ace uh, in the Second World War that uh, was alive at this time. And he had 72 kills in the Second World War. Far too valuable to send back overseas. Um, and they used him for... Um, for uh, uh, public uh, affairs and 
public relations uh, building in Canada, but he makes a cameo appearance. Now, uh, an interesting thing is Billy was not a very tall man, and unfortunately, um, in order to make the movie, they had to make a little ramp for Billy to stand on when he pinned the wings on. And if you watch the movie, um, there's a few Americans that are getting their wings in this, uh, in this movie. So the history is all around us uh, from the BC ATP today, and if you're in downtown Ottawa and you're driving along Sussex Drive, you drive uh, eastbound past the Rideau Falls and you're on your way to the Prime Minister's house, you're going to see the uh, Commonwealth Memorial. But there's more. Ottawa McDonald uh, International Airport, that's our main airport in Ottawa. Well, that's where our friend McGee got his wings and that's where Captains of the Clouds was uh, filmed for the wing. This is where Robert Hampton Gray, our, our friend that won the uh, Victoria Cross for attacking the Japanese uh, ship. That's where he got his wings. How about Armprior, Ontario? Armprior, Ontario was a flight instructor school and they had a whole kaleidoscope of aircraft. What about Portage La Prairie? That's where um, Bill McRae, uh, that's where he went for his elementary flying training in a uh, Tiger Moth. How about Brandon, Manitoba? I love this picture. Um, these triangle airports dot Canada coast to coast. They are everywhere and wherever you see an airport laid out in a triangle, rest assured that's a British Commonwealth Air Training Plan built airport. And Brandon, Manitoba where we have our British Commonwealth Air Training Plan Museum. They trained in the Anson and the, and the Cessna Crane. Winnipeg, Manitoba has always been a, uh, an important place uh, for pilot training because of its wide open spaces, wide open spaces. and um, they trained air observers um, at, uh, at Winnipeg and a famous air observer that went through Winnipeg is uh, uh, Richard Burton, a famous actor with all the wives and they used Anson's. Now back to Vintage Wings of Canada, what are we going to do? Well Vintage Wings of Canada, our job is to uh, tell stories to Canadians and the rest of the world and we do this using our aircraft. Now we're going to tell the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan story using our uh, collection of yellow aircrafts, hence the name Yellow Wings. First aircraft we're going to use is our beloved uh, Tiger Moth. And there's a picture of our Tiger Moth uh, just uh, one day ago or two days ago uh, taking off from uh, a wintry scene. I love this picture. This is what Vintage Wings is all about. You know exactly what's happening in this picture. The young lady and the young gentleman sitting in the cockpit are for the first time experiencing cause and effect. They're pulled back on the stick and they see the elevators going up. That one picture alone captures what we are going to do this summer. So we're going to use our Tiger Moth. We're going to use a fleet Finch. And there's our, uh, our beloved Finch. It's getting its wings rebuilt at this moment. We're going to use a fleet Cornell. There's, uh, there's our Cornell being wheeled into the hangar. That's what our Cornell looks like right now, but it'll fly on the 1st of April. And we're going to use our Harvard. Now, the um, people out there that know realize our Harvard is a Mark IV Harvard. And we've repainted it to yield a Mark II Harvard. And I realize the canopy's wrong and there's a stand tube in the left fuel tank. The gear and flap lever are different, but I have to tell you the story of why we call the airplane the High Flight Harvard. Take a close look at this picture. This is at an air show in a model version, of a jet powered I should say, model version of the Avro Arrow is out flying. The operator loses control of his model airplane and it crashes into the tail of our Harvard. Look at the people behind. Thank God our Harvard was there. Of course the first one out of the car on the left is our Vice President of uh, Maintenance, Andre Janik, uh, running to expect the, inspect the scene and he's probably going, holy cow, how am I going to fix this? So what are we going to do? Our aircraft is damaged and we have to come up with a solution. So we circle back around to Mr. McGee, our poet. Um, now Mr. McGee was posted to 412 Squadron and he um, wrote his poem while he was uh, on 412 Squadron. And so here he is on August 18th, 1941, the part that's highlighted out of his logbook 
It says, climb to 33,000 feet. This is a letter to his parents. It says, uh, I'm enclosing something I wrote the other day. It started at 30,000 feet and finished soon after I landed. I thought it would interest you. And then it goes on to say, please turn over, PTO, please turn over for Ditty. And there's the poem, High Flight. He's on 412 Squadron. He's in a uh, Spitfire Mark V. He's climbed to 30,000 feet. He's written this poem. He lands. He sends it off to his parents. We love this story so much. Our dedicated uh, historians searched and searched and searched and searched to try and match up a picture of a Harvard with a picture that McGee flew. <clears throat> After a long time, they realized they'd found a beautiful picture of Harvard number 2866. And here we see on this page of his logbook, he's flown it three times. And there's the picture that we used of 2866. So after careful measuring, uh, Robert Kosteka is the gentleman in the red shirt on the right-hand side. He's who we have to thank for this wonderful presentation, putting it together. And Dave O'Malley is the genius behind uh, everything we do at Vintage Wings uh, graphically. There they are, uh, looking at pictures to try and figure out how they're going to turn our Harvard into 2866. Uh, tape measure, a little paint, a little vinyl decals, and there is our Mark IV Harvard 2866. Now try and capture that imagination, that try and imagine and capture that visual as we look at the original of McGee's 2866. Yes, I know ours is a Mark for Harvard, but we're proud of it. Of course, um, one of the reasons we fly this aircraft is not only to uh, tell stories, but also to retain some of the expertise and some of the knowledge. And I think that picture really captures the essence of what Harvard flying is all about. How are we going to celebrate this British Commonwealth Air Training Plan? It's, a, it's an enormous undertaking. This the scope is way beyond anything Canada has ever done. Well, we started with uh, our friends at the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association, and they jumped on board right away. And in their December issue of their magazine and newspaper that goes out to all their members, um, they ran a big picture on the front page and a full page and a half inside. And we started to circulate a, a, a plan. We've got an idea. We've got a plan. We're going to run a bunch of airplanes from coast to coast. The problem we've got is Canada's a darn big place, and except for the Harvard, the Fleet Finch, the Fleet Cornell, and the Tiger Moth are, are essentially ultralight aircraft. It is a big country, and it's taking a phenomenal amount of logistics, but I, I, we have a phenomenal amount of uh, support and activity being drummed up at all these British Commonwealth Air Training Plan uh, bases. And we'll be supported by a, a, a ground vehicle. Of course, you don't go anywhere in a Tiger Moth without some cylinders and some brakes, and the same with a Finch. And for a Harvard, we'll be well. A Harvard works pretty good, um, but we'll need some support on the ground. And we've already started our our plan to celebrate the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And we took our Tiger Moth to Montebello, Quebec, for a big fly-in of ultralight and other ski-equipped aircraft. Um, our next winter event um, for the Tiger Moth is we'll be heading over um, to. Uh, a big fly-in breakfast on the Ottawa River, on the ice of the Ottawa River. And then we have a bit of a hiatus. And away we go in uh, June. We start off in North Bay, Ontario at Armed Forces Day. Then the uh, Harvard and the Cornell uh, make their way westbound out to the foothills of the prairies um, for a huge reunion of Harvards in the Penhold uh, base. Then we're over to the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association, um, their annual convention out in uh, Boundary Bay, and while we're out in the Vancouver area, we've got um, some friends that want us to drop in and help us help them celebrate the British Commonwealth uh, Air Training Plan. Um, places like, uh, I'm sorry, the COPA Convention's in Langley, my air. We're going to go to Boundary Bay, we're going to go to Langley, Pitt Meadows. We double back to um, Edmonton, where our, our Finch and our Tiger Moth are going to be uh, doing yeoman's work. Um, we spend some time in Edmonton. The problem we have in Edmonton is the downtown airport is um, threatened with being closed. And what we are helping COPA do 
in general, aviation in general, is to draw attention to this airport. It needs to stay open. It's, it's, it's a historical airport. It was part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan. And we need to remind politicians how important it is to keep these airports operating. We'll be in Wetaskiwin, Calgary, Springbank, uh, back to Calgary. Um, our big sponsor is WestJet, and uh, we'll certainly be supporting their family day. Um, then we've got barbecues all across the prairies, Swift Current, um, Regina, Moose Jaw, um, not the air base because it's a bit cumbersome. Uh, we'll have quite a few airplanes with us. Into Brandon, uh, missing here that our uh, recent additions are uh, Portage to Prairie and um, Winnipeg. Then we hit Air Venture down in uh, Oshkosh. Um, out of Air Venture, we start hitting Southern Ontario. Um, in this part, of the schedule is really a work in progress. Uh, there's many airports that have popped on the radar scope just in the last uh, few days and in recently in the last few hours while I was making uh, the final adjustments to this PowerPoint, emails kept, um, kept coming in. And we'll be hitting air shows as we go on our cross-country tour. But the best air show of all, of course, is the air show that we're in partnership with uh, for the Experimental uh, Aircraft Association. And our, our air show this year runs the 16th to the 18th in Gatineau, and that ends the end of our tour. So our little yellow airplanes um, head out in early June, and we get them back uh, mid-September. That's a big undertaking. We've got strategic partners. Um, the Department of National Defense is a big supporter uh, of what we're doing. Um, of course, the Experimental Aircraft Association are very close friends that have allowed us to uh, put on this uh, presentation this evening. The Canadian Owners and Pilots Association, our good friends in Hamilton, the Warplane Heritage, we work very closely with them as we do the Canadian Aviation Historical Society. And not to be left out, the Canadian Naval uh, Aviation Group, those are Canadian pilots. Um, military pilots that wore their wings on their sleeve. Um, they're an important part of our world also. Um, I'm afraid this list has grown uh, exponentially in the last 24 hours, but most of the major museums uh, along the way are on board with us. We're a uh, public charitable organization. Everything we do needs money. We need $150,000 to make this work. All the pilots are volunteer. Everybody's volunteering their time. So far, we've raised about $87,000 to make this work, and we need uh, a little bit more. And where is that going to come from? Well, membership sales. Like everything we do, um, we rely on our members to help support us. We rely on them to help us um, build aircraft, to put on air shows, to do all this phenomenal research um, that has yielded this uh, presentation this evening. Um, we also have a ride program, and the ride program will involve people sponsoring our aircraft um, because they're all two-seat aircraft. They'll be able to uh, ride along and experience what it would have been like to fly in an open cockpit or in a BCATP training aircraft um, as we cross Canada. Um, a gentleman by the name of Ted Barris has helped us out phenomenally. Um, he's written a book, and he's um, permitted us to have this book at a phenomenal discount, and we'll be selling his book, Behind the Glory. Of course, there's swag. Everywhere you go at an air show, we sell swag, and that's another way we'll be generating uh, revenue. Uh, that's T-shirts, keychains, uh, the normal thing, and we also sell uh, our swag online. We also are doing appearance fees as we cross the country. There's um, a few uh, organizations that for uh, a tank of gas and a hotel room um, have asked us to come and speak and make this presentation to their civic leaders mainly to remind them why it's important to keep their airport sponsored, why it's important to fund their airport and keep it alive. And of course, um, like most people in this business, there comes a time when you have to help your customers uh, do something. And um, sponsorship is a critical part of our world, as it is in automobile racing and in most major sports. We've got a few different tiers of our sponsorship. Um, and we've got um, uh, people that have expressed interest into sponsoring an aircraft that goes um, all the way across Canada, where we'll make sure that um, the, we get the word out of what a proud supporter you are of our um, aircraft, and with that comes a plethora of uh, opportunities to tell your company's story. 
Um, we've got a little bit um, reduced program for sponsorship um, where we'll still um, tell the world about your story. And um, we've got a, for more localized activity, um, we've got a $5,000 sponsorship. We haven't seen much of this. We've, what we've really been seeing is people are more interested in giving us $5,000 um, just because it's the right thing to do. We like those people. Finally, who's doing all this work? Um, the people who are uh, doing all of the lay work, um, program lead, that's uh, Ulrich Bollinger. Ulrich is a uh, retired uh, fighter pilot from the military, um, and he's our lead on the Harvard. He's the program manager pulling it all together. We've got uh, Dave Hatfield. Dave is a uh, A330 captain for Air Canada. He's got uh, 20 million hours in light Tiger Moth type aircraft, and he's the gentleman that spearheaded our P-40 through restoration and took Stocky Edwards uh, flying. The whole world at um, Vintage Wings revolves around Carol and Leslie, um, and so she's got her hand in everything we do. And there's no sense doing anything if you don't tell anybody, so we've got uh, Mary Lee runs public affairs, and if you uh, need some help, if you want us to come to your airport, it'll be Mary Lee that will help provide the package that will tie you in, and we'll help you get in charge, in touch with your mayor, we'll help you get in charge with your city councillors to uh, bring them out. Um, if you want to give us money, Kevin always takes money, and then at the bottom of the food chain, if you can't find anybody else, I'm always there to help. That's the end of our uh, Yellow Wings Across Canada tribute, and I uh, thank you for being patient while we told this story this evening. Well, that's uh, terrific, Rob. A fantastic, fascinating presentation. Uh, really great look at the history of the program and, uh, and a wonderful preview of, uh, of what you folks are going to be doing this coming summer. We know we certainly are excited to see uh, all that many more yellow wings uh, come visit us here in Oshkosh in July, and uh, not to mention the other stops, uh, hoping to get out to uh, your show in Gatineau myself, as a matter of fact. Uh, we have just a, a few uh, questions and comments that came in, which is good. We are uh, just coming up uh, on the hour here pretty soon. Um, <clears throat> I'll run through these. Uh, uh, first off, uh, uh, Cam Herod is out there and uh, said hello to both of us, and uh, just wanted to say really enjoyed the presentation. It was a great job. So uh, kudos to you, uh, Rob. And uh, I do see uh, you've mentioned uh, our uh, mutual friend, Rob Kisteka. I see he is uh, in the audience. So rest assured he heard uh, your uh, kudos and expressions of appreciation. So uh, mine uh, to him as well. And we have uh, a few questions here uh, from uh, John Leeds. And want to... Uh, try to put these together. Now he's got, uh, Robbie, I've got to apologize. He's got two questions about uh, an SFTS, and I'm not entirely sure on the pronunciation. Uh, I believe it's, uh, uh, I would say it's Clairsholm. It's C-L-A-R-E-S-H-O-L-M. Uh, so. uh, sorry, how can you just repeat that one more time? Please? Sure, no problem. Uh, There's a couple of questions about SFTF, excuse me, SFTS. And and the name of the town is uh, I would say maybe it's Claire's home. It's C L A R E S H O L M. Oh, <laughs> well, Am I thank even you close? very much. <clears throat> so help me with the pronunciation first, and then I'll let you know what the questions are. Oh, very good. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, um, uh, first of all, we're we're sorry we spelt uh, uh, Claire's home wrong. But if there's um, specific questions about um, the various airports, um, what I'd really like to do is capture those questions uh, electronically, and I'll send them to our um, our experts. I, I'm I'm only the uh, the conduit here this evening, okay. Um, so and I'm, I'm I'm not that knowledgeable about the specific uh, SFTSs. Okay, well, fair enough. Well, uh, John had questions, uh, wondering if there were any pictures of Claire's home, and then also. Uh, uh, was questioning uh, the aircraft used there specifically, so I can certainly uh, certainly grab these and send those to you as a as a follow up email, Rob, and uh, you know, we can sort of circulate it back from there. Um, John okay. Leeds, if uh, if you're still with us and you're you're listening, uh, it would be great if you could email me directly at h brian h b r y a n at e a a dot org. Uh, make sure I have your contact info there as well. Um, there was a, uh, a direct, very direct question uh, for you, Rob, uh, from a friend of mine out west, uh, Carrie Sim, 
uh, and a little bit off topic, but he's asking if you're aware of the uh, 70th uh, reunion of 419 Squadron in Kamloops this year. And it's, uh, all 419 members from 1941 to present are invited, and he's wondering if, if maybe you had flown out of uh, uh, Cold Lake with 419. Oh, wow. You know, um, 419 Squadron is a, um, a very important squadron for a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, obviously, um, our, our friend uh, Monarski uh, and the Warplane Heritage Lancaster dedicated to him from 419 Squadron. Um, but it also holds a special place in my heart because I flew F-5s as a student um, for six or eight months on uh, 419 Squadron. So if um, we'd be happy to uh, try and help out there, if uh, you could send me an email, um, I'd, be thr I'd be thrilled to connect into Ulrich Bollinger um, and try and do whatever whatever I can. It's a special squadron for me. Okay, well that's great. Well, I hopefully uh, Carrie is still out there listening, and uh, I will uh, I'll do a short email introduction uh, to the two of you after this, and uh, we can take care of that there. Uh, let's see, there's a few more things that are that are coming in. Um, uh, Cam is asking a question for me about EAA's plans for the BCATP celebration uh, this year, and I, I know we're still finalizing that, but he's asking if there will be a, an area designated for BCATP aircraft to be parked and displayed. Now, I know, um, Rob, that uh, with you and your aircraft, we are setting aside a special uh, display area. What I don't know for sure is if uh, that's uh, going to be something that will be open to all relevant aircraft or exactly how we're going to handle that. So. Uh, Cam, I apologize, I don't have a very clear answer to your question, but please uh, keep an eye on uh, airventure.org, our website, and we'll have more details as those uh, as those come out. Uh, I know, for example, we usually have uh, maybe at least one uh, C-model moth and one finch that show up down in the, the vintage area, whether we'll be able to sort of coordinate getting those together as part of a great yellow fleet. Uh, I don't know for certain, but I, I, I kind of hope so. <laughs> well, very good. I, I should mention, Hal, there's... Um, our website uh, for these this Yellow Wings program is uh, fairly simple. It's www.yellowwings.ca, uh, and um, uh, we are constantly updating the uh, schedule on this Yellow Wings uh, website. And we'd be thrilled to have anybody join and fly along with us, whether you have a BCATP aircraft or not. Um, we already have a number of people that have expressed an interest in um, following us all the way down to uh, Oshkosh from Western Canada. So uh, please come and join with us, and um, we'll keep posting stuff at vintagewings.ca um, as we go forward. And I was funny uh, just before I started this presentation, I was sending an email uh, to Connie at uh, EAA, um, trying to make some arrangements. We're also bringing our swordfish. That's the the, the aircraft that represents um, the type that would have dropped torpedoes and uh, damaged the Bismarck and our Lysander down. So we'll have um, we'll have a reasonable fleet down at Oshkosh this year. No fighters though. Well, that's uh, that's great to hear. I certainly look forward to the airplanes. I I uh, couldn't resist, as I, I said, mentioning at the beginning that uh, that I've got a lot of experience flying the the. 82 C's, and I, I maintain a, a Canadian license in addition to my U.S. license, just so that I can I can get up there and and uh, sort of go through my own little Commonwealth Air Training Plan anytime I get up to Canada and see some friends up in Southern Ontario. So uh, it means the world to me in particular. But I, of course, I, I'm sure I speak for <laughs> more than just me when I say how excited we are to see some of the airplanes coming. Uh, a couple of other uh, other things that have come in. Um, I believe you just answered uh, Richard Scalina's questions. He was uh, asking for uh, web addresses uh, to talk about donations, and uh, uh, Rob, you'll appreciate this. He's specifically asking uh, for a web address where he can find commemorative items to purchase. So uh, you mentioned yellowwings.ca and I believe vintagewings.ca. Did I get those both correct? Yes. If you can get to yellowwings.ca by going first to our main website, vintagewings.ca, and um, you, you'll find everything there. And if you can't, you get a hold of me, and I'll make sure you get it. Terrific. Okay, let me make sure that I'm uh, getting caught up here. This the list of questions uh, is built up just a bit, but I think we've, we've just about got them all. Um, a couple more comments. Uh, uh, Ken Meitzer. Uh, says, uh, this is an excellent presentation. I wish the youth in Canada could have this presentation in school. Uh, the story needs a lot more publicity in this country. And, uh, Rob, I'm sure you'd agree with that. And I can say, uh, uh, Rob, before you may want to respond, 
that uh, I did mention at the beginning, the presentation has been recorded, and uh, that will be available open to anybody. Uh, you'll find it at eaavideo.org or a direct link at eaa.org slash webinars. Uh, usually that takes, I, I conservatively, two business days for that to go up and get live, but otherwise, uh, once that's available, uh, Rob, we hope you'll uh, you'll take the link and uh, and share it with everyone, and maybe maybe post it on your site and uh, or even embed it there, and people go watch it right on your site as well. Very, very good. I I, sh I should mention that's a very important part. I don't know if you remember, we had a picture of a tiger moth with a, a young boy and a young girl looking at how the elevators went as they pulled down the stick, or at least that's exactly what I'm feeling. Um, I'll be out on the road. Um, and Ulrich Bollinger will be there. He's our team lead, um, or or Dave Hatfield, um, and um, we would be uh, honored if um, if a Canadian um, base or a Canadian airports listening, we'd be honored to go and speak to school children. That that's what we do, and we'd be happy to make this presentation. But the one caveat is that we'll be out on the road, unfortunately, through most of the school break. Sure. So, well, that would be uh, be great. Hopefully, get the word out. And and frankly, I would love to see this information uh, be more prominently known in the U.S. as well. Uh, obviously, uh, you know, we were a, we were a bit late to the uh, to the party, but it it ended up playing a huge part in uh, in uh, our air crew and our our training, of course, as you as you know better than anyone. Let's see here. We're just about the end. Uh, Bill Carswell, uh, just some more uh, some more good feedback for you, Rob. As usual, Rob, a top-notch presentation. Uh, congratulations to you and Rob K. and Dave on a first-rate presentation. Uh, you and Ben and Wings of Canada, the group, can be proud of your efforts on this important initiative. So uh, definitely kudos there. And uh, I mentioned uh, that uh, we're hopeful that uh, Ray Haas uh, will be uh, giving a presentation about John McGee and High Flight at Oshkosh this year. I haven't seen a definitive forum schedule quite this early, but uh, hopefully that will be available as well. A great presentation uh, on uh, the, the writing of the poem and all of that. So, let's see, it looks like. I believe that uh, that catches us up with the questions that have come in. So I'm not seeing... Uh, not seeing any others. So with that, Rob, I think we will go ahead and wrap it up for the night, but uh, uh, we can't thank you enough for taking the time to to present and uh, help us uh, just deliver some of this great content. Uh, on a personal note, uh, I, I've certainly uh, met a number of people from Vintage Wings, but I don't believe you and I have had the chance to say hello, so I look forward to meeting you this summer at Oshkosh. Excellent. I uh, I look forward to meeting you, Hal, and um, I uh, thank the Experimental Aircraft Association, all their members, Vintage Wings members, um, that uh, will help us celebrate uh, this important part of uh, aviation history. Thanks, Hal. Thank you, Rob, and thanks to uh, everyone who came and attended tonight, and thanks in advance to those of you that are listening on the recording. And final thanks to our sponsor, Aircraft Spruce and Specialty, for making this possible. With that, thanks again, and good night, everybody. <laughs>